to everybody. We will start uh, slowly. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar entitled Cultural Mobility in European Outermost Region and Overseas Country and Territories. My name is Marie Le Sour and I work for On The Move. Um, and I will start with some technicalities. Uh, I guess most of you are used to them, but it's also important to uh, repeat them. Um, so first of all, if you do not speak, uh, please remain on mute so that also this meeting room can remain quiet and that we can hear um, you know, the speaker and the moderator uh, speaking. Uh, then you can, uh, this webinar will be in English, but you can, if you wish, uh, use the uh, transcription uh, that is available if you click um, at the bottom right of your screen uh, with, um, usually there is a, a sign which is called the icon called CC, and you can use the live transcription that may help you as well uh, to make the, 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 the understanding better. And um, as you have maybe noticed, uh, this uh, webinar is recorded because we plan also to make it available uh, for future viewing. And also because this web stream right now uh, in partnership with our collaborator and member whole round. So I guess it's all good now with the technicalities. Most of the people are in the room. Maybe some people will come a bit, little bit later. Um, thanks to the focus, I would say, of this webinar, we have people, um, you know, uh, coming from different time zones, so morning, afternoon, uh, evening. So once again, welcome to everybody. Hello, uh, so my name is Marie Le Sour, and I work for On The Move. And uh, together with my uh, colleague, uh, Johan Flock and Tania Sanchez, we are very happy to welcome you to this uh, webinar. Uh, I will give a few words very quickly about On The Move uh, in case you don't know about the organization. So On The Move is a mobility information uh, network and we uh, gather more than 60 member organizations and individuals in Europe, but also internationally in more than 25 countries. And our main mission is to signpost um, free, updated, and regular mobility opportunities for artists and cultural professionals in all disciplines, but also to advocate for a fairer and more sustainable uh, cultural mobility. Um, we implement a multi-annual program, um, which is co-funded by the European Union, and this webinar is taking place part of this program. Um, and um, this is the first webinar that we are organizing this year. There will be a second webinar at the end of the year. And uh, for this first one, uh, we are working uh, in partnership uh, with the um, uh, partner of the EU-funded Archipel project that will be presented uh, later. And this project is funded by the European Union and is led by the Institut Français. Before I pass the word to our partner for this event, um, I would like to recall uh, three main objectives of this uh, webinar, I would say of this series of webinars in general and of this particular uh, webinar. Uh, the first uh, objective is really to uh, try as much as possible to touch on less visible and less discuss uh, issues related to mobility. And that's why I will focus this time to focus on uh, European outermost region and overseas country and territories. Uh, the second one is very much as much as possible to leave the world and uh, to art professional and artists being connected to this particular country, region, and territories are being based there, and uh, so that they can share with them uh, trends, uh, burning issues, and needs related to cultural mobility in this region. So if we take the example of today, it can be related to their sense of belonging to Europe, the effect uh, of the pandemic, the way also like to rethink um, post-colonial artistic practices based also on the very context. And last but not least, um, this, the idea is also not to do a kind of standalone 
type of event, but also to further share the learning uh, of this uh, webinar. So that means that the video will be uh, accessible afterwards uh, on all the website uh, partner and also like with our collaborator around. And we would like as well very much to share resources that will be uh, signposted also like during this event and also to share reflection idea that can help us as well be it on the move and all the partner uh, you know and and professional gather today to help us also to reshape to rethink of fair way fairer way sorry to support uh, cultural mobility which can also include a greater diversity of artists and cultural professional so that's it now for my introduction. And without further ado, I would like to pass the word to Madina Regno, who is the project leader of Archipel.eu project uh, at the Institut Francais. Madina, the word is to you. Thank you so much, Marie. I would like to start my intervention by introducing Archipel.eu. So Archipel.eu is a European Union co-founded pilot project, as you say, it's providing uh, funding opportunities for artists and cultural organizations coming from the nine outermost region of the European Union and also from the 13 overseas countries and territories. Taking into account the specific context and needs of the cultural and creative sectors of these territories, a consortium of three institutions developed Archipel.eu. The Institut Francais, located in Paris, who is leading the program, the Association of Overseas Countries and Territories, OCTA, located in Brussels, and the Atlantic Cultural Promotion Agency, APCA, located in Madeira. Archipel.eu aims to test over 24 months a mechanism to provide direct financial support to cultural professional artists, groups of artists, but also organizations that are all located in any of these territories. We are working in collaboration with a group of 10 associated partners, including networks such as, of course, On The Move, Relais Culture Europe or UNIC, for instance. We also have associated partners based in the ORs and the OCTs, and we also have two universities as associated partners. At the end of the 24 month period, we will present a report to the European Commission, including the outcomes of the pilot projects and also the recommendation especially regarding mobility issues for artists and professionals in the cultural field. The fact that mobility is a key component of this pilot project is something that we do have in common with On The Move. This is why I would like to thank On The Move for inviting Archipel.eu to partner up for this webinar. With um, Archipel.eu's team, we have organized several webinars since the launch of the program. Although for the moment, the aim of the webinar was to introduce or call for projects. So this is extremely useful to be part of another type of webinar in which we can hear some testimonies of artists that will definitely give us some inputs and ideas regarding mobility challenges. Since the launch event of Archipel.eu last October, we have also launched four calls for projects. And the cultural mobility is at the center of three of our calls. So let me just introduce the calls very briefly. In the framework of the fund called La Collection Archipel.eu, we are going to finance 15 projects. La Collection Archipel.eu aims to support the dissemination of exhibitions, shows, artistic proposals in order to promote the creativity of these territories. We have a budget of 150,000 euros dedicated for this specific fund, and the project can be supported up to 20,000 euros. We are now supporting structure in order to help them to strengthen their international strategy. So at the moment, we are asking ourselves one question, where do you want to go? And it's very interesting to see in terms of mobilities that there are different uh, trajectories. For instance, there is a strong interest to connect with countries and islands nearby. This is the case for Madeira, Canarias, and SRS. Or another example is from the French, French OR, such as Martinique, Guadeloupe, La Réunion. We can also notice that there is a need to strengthen the connection with the African continent. This is the case for La Collection. We have another fund called Cultural Network and Cooperation Archipel.eu. This call is currently open and the applicant can submit their proposal until the 1st of July. 
The aim of this fund is to promote exchange between the outermost region, the overseas countries and territories, and the European Union. And we have dedicated a budget of 150,000 euros for this multidisciplinary fund. We also have another fund called the Mobility, Mobility Fund Archipel.eu. This is the only call that is for individuals, artists, group of artists, and also professionals for the cultural field. This fund supports the physical and virtual as well mobility of cultural sectors. And we have allocated a budget of 100,000 100, euros for this call. And the, the call is open until December 2022. So this is just to give you an idea of the, the, the type of project that we, we are supporting. While implementing this experimental project, we are taking into consideration the differences of context between ORs and OCTs and between each territory. We have noticed a major difference of context between opportunities that are provided to artists located, for instance, in the French ORs and artists located in Spanish or Portuguese ORs or even in the Dutch Caribbean, for instance. This is why it's important for us to see where there's a need and where we can make a difference. This is why I look forward to hearing from artists coming from Madeira, from also the OCTs, such as the Dutch Caribbean or Greenland. And speaking about OCTs, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to give the floor to Hélène Morales from Okta, who's working with me on the implementation of archipel.eu. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice webinar. Thank you so much, Madina. Well, um, my name is Hélène Morales, and I'm a culture advisor in charge of coordinating the Archipel.eu project at the overseas countries and territories level at OCTA, which is one of the Archipel.eu consortium members, as Madina just mentioned. Before I try to give a quick glance at the cultural mobility environment in the OCTs, um, I would like, if you, if you agree, um, give you a few words on OCTA. Funded by its 13 members, uh, which are the 13 OCTs associated to Denmark, France, and the Netherlands, and co-funded by the EU, OCTA serves as a platform uh, through which the OCTs realize their common goal by working collectively through cooperation, policy dialogue, the promotion of common positions and partnerships for the sustainable development of the OCTs. Culture, notably embodied in the Archipel.eu project, is a key dimension of OCTA's strategy for 2127, as foreseen in its strategic pillar three on youth, culture, and education. Cultural mobility in the OCTs is both an opportunity and a challenge for artists, creators, and cultural professionals. An opportunity first, as mobility is inter alia a way to disseminate and promote the local culture and artistic scene and to connect the many artistic and cultural actors with their peers, both in other European overseas or continent, as well as within their geographical regions with the international neighbors. It is also a challenge because of the geographical situation of the OCTs, which are islands, and the specific status of the OCTs, um, their citizens their citizens are European, um, although the islands are not part of the EU. Local artists and cultural professionals face difficulties to find funding and support for their mobility project, in addition to facing expensive travel costs. For my exchange with Archipel, the EU applicants, I've also noticed that following the global pandemic, individual artists are focusing on implementing local projects rather than envisaging themselves in international contexts. Not to mention, of course, that new travel regulations have also complicated the mobility process. So this is this first glance um, about the OCTs and, and the mobility opportunities and challenges in those territories. And I'm now giving the floor to, to my colleague, Elena. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elena Munichosa. In the same way as my consortium colleagues have done, I would also like to start by greeting and thanking the amazing On The Move team for all the hard work and organization while preparing this very interesting webinar event um, on mobility. I am the team leader for the Archipel.au project on behalf of APCA, the Agency for the Promotion of the Atlantic Culture. 
here with us uh, in the audience and also representing APCA are my two colleagues, Sonia Marx, uh, APCA's project manager and Gifli Zolveira, social media manager. Um, as part of the Archipel Project Consortium, one of our main missions is to oversee the communication efforts, ensuring the digital presence and visibility. APCA is a nonprofit private organization based in the beautiful Madeira Island uh, since 2005, with the purpose of contributing for the Atlantic Island culture, knowledge and arts development throughout the widest geographical area possible. So being an organization based in the outermost region, an OR, um, I could not refrain from mentioning that we get to witness and see firsthand the inherent issues of cultural isolation of an island and sometimes the struggle that the cultural sector has to face on mobility matters. Uh, therefore, the relevance of having a discussion on the subject of international artistic and cultural mobility. So thank you everyone for your presence and have a nice webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Helena, Hélène, and uh, Madina for this uh, introduction. Um, and before I pass the word to Claire, uh, Claire Hosting Wilson, who will be the, the moderator of this session, um, I would like, um, we wanted to keep this meeting room spirit also to, to make it a bit more, uh, you know, like uh, connecting people um, than a, a webinar type of format. But now during the time of the session of the meeting, we may ask uh, you, uh, also, maybe to turn off your camera so that we can really uh, see our uh, moderator, uh, Claire, and also our speakers, Suzanne, Sarah, and Shirley. Um, and um, so I, I will uh, kindly ask you that. And, and after, uh, of course, you can ask also any question you may have uh, in the chat, and we will collect them. So thank you very much. And Claire, the word is to you. Thank you, um, and thank you for all the partners for enabling such a such an interesting webinar today. Um, so my name is Claire Wilson, and for uh, the visually impaired, I'm a female in my 30s of medium build, wearing glasses and uh, medium brown hair, um, and I'm the facilitator for today's session. Um, so I'll just uh, briefly share my screen so we can have a look at where we're going today um, in this webinar. Um, so we've got an example today of a European outermost region, which is the Madeira Islands, and it's one of two autonomous regions of Portugal. Um, it's an archipelago situated in the North Atlantic Ocean. It's north of the Canary Islands and about 500 kilometres west of Morocco. And so we'll be travelling here today with Sara Andro, who was born in Funchal in Madeira Islands. And she's a dancer and a choreographer interested in meditative and ecstatic practices in, and her works are often developed in relation to natural environments and particular ecosystems. Um, so we've also got two examples of overseas countries and territories, um, uh, one of which is Curaçao in the Dutch Caribbean. Um, and the Dutch Caribbean is uh, comprises of constituent countries and special municipalities of the Netherlands. And they're spread over two distinct areas in the Caribbean, one closer to Venezuela uh, and one closer to Puerto Rico. And so we're traveling here today with Shirley Emanuelsen, who is a filmmaker and a visual artist based in the Dutch Caribbean. Um, and in addition to her creative practice, uh, she also has founded UniArt, which is an artist-run foundation that enhances the visibility and development of emerging professional artists in the region. And the other area we're traveling to today is Greenland, which is an island nation located in the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans, and is the world's largest island and is one of three constituent countries that form the United, uh, the Kingdom of Denmark, along with Denmark and the Faroe Islands. And we're traveling here today with Suzanne Andreessen, who is the artistic director of the National Theatre of Greenland. And she works as a dramaturg and a teacher at the National Acting School of Greenland. Um, so she has uh, extensive experience in the cultural sector in the Nordic and Arctic regions. 
Um, so I'll just go back, uh, go back to the lovely faces of our speakers. Um, so today, what we're interested in exploring uh, is is what it means to be a creative practitioner um, in these uh, European outermost regions and overseas countries and territories. What are the the flows? Um, that, that are present, what are the relationships both within the regions and between the regions and Europe? Um, and kind of questioning what does international, international mobility mean in these contexts? So we'll look at a few of the themes uh, such as sustainable travel, um, traveling through fragile ecosystems, um, potentially the impact of tourism and, and maybe how COVID has um, has changed these mobilities and perhaps opened up opened up opportunities. Um, and I guess we're, it would be interesting to work towards some recommendations on, on how to support mobility in these regions, um, what needs to change, what's going well, what's working. Um, so I'd like to sort of uh, jump right in with, quest, uh, with sort of discussions, um, but perhaps starting with a relatively open question by way of introduction to these regions of, by asking each of our speakers, what are the realities and challenges of mobility from, from your perspective? Um, so Suzanne, would you like to kick it off by kind of um, naming a few of the, the specific challenges in the Greenland context? Sure, thank you. Uh, just a brief introduction. I'm Suzanne and you already presented me, but uh, I'm a female in my forties short curly hair wearing glasses and a bright blue shirt um, and I um, thank you so much for for this in Greenland we sort of we're in a special position between uh, we're very close to the Nordic countries um, it's a it's a close collaborator and I often say this is where the money is because there is funding for Nordic projects. And, and we also have access to those funds and we have sort of one leg there. Uh, so also uh, because of our close connection with Denmark, but then our closest neighbor is actually Canada. So that's on the other, the other leg is there. And since it's, uh, uh, we're connected to all the Inuit areas that goes across uh, Canada, um, Alaska and a small part of Russia. This is, I sometimes I say, this is where the heart is because it's the same uh, culture, it's the same uh, language, it's, it's the same history, a lot of it. So, so we're looking at some of the challenges that is, we can't just take a direct flight to Canada, but it's only 16 kilometers away. We have to go through Europe to go to, go to Canada. And it's our closest, you know, um, uh, uh, neighbor. And, um, and I think the, the way that the Canadian funds works in what, from what the little I know of them is that there is direct mobility funding for individual artists. And that is something we don't have in Greenland, for example. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's some of the challenges that we have sort of a, uh, those two, two legs. Mm. Yeah, and I think, Charlie, we'd, we'd spoken before a bit about this, the connections and, and sort of the, the link with Europe and how that sort of impacts the, the local mobility in a way. Yes, um, hi everyone. I'll also introduce by describing myself. I'm a black a Caribbean female in my 30s, brown hair, dreadlocks, wearing blue. Um, yeah, um, it's uh, lovely to be here. Um, in terms of my, um, my situation as an um, artist and um, yeah, that I founded organization in the Dutch Caribbean. For us, the Netherlands is our main point of reference and, and, and almost always has been. Um, so depending, because we're six in total and each has kind of its different status within the kingdom, it makes it very complex already on the language level because Three Island speaks at least four, la uh, four languages and the other, um, which is divided also half Dutch, half French have all sorts of other <laughs> languages that are going on. 
Um, so um, Dutch is still the official language that automatically also um, separates you um, linguistically from um, um, a larger international um, audience. Um, for us, um, one of the challenges I can um, I can mention from the get go is that um, the support or financial support is almost non existent for local governments. And when it comes for the Dutch um, institutions and funding opportunities, it's only in the coming years that there has been a drastic change in that, where there is a more outreach for programs or at least open calls and, and um, especially description, descriptive for the islands. But previous to that, it was very little. So therefore, um, you can imagine that um, you would think that there are museums or cultural organizations that have a program all throughout. That would not be the case. So most museums, if they exist, are run by um, 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 yeah, um, volunteer work, by individuals who find it important. Um, the artists, there is a lot of talent, there is a lot of artists, so a lot is being done. But in, term, in terms of professionalizing their career, that always you see that it stops at a particular age or um, and most of the time is because there is no uh, infrastructure or network that can continue the growth. Um, and also because there is no going um, off island. So in terms of mobility, um, often it's believed that the chances are abroad um, and um, abroad meaning the Netherlands and the rest of the world is kind of this um, unachievable or very dream-like reality that, um, um, that, yeah, one wonders how to start um, to get there. Um, there is a lot more, but yeah, let me, that's a, a brief. Uh... Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a, good, a good start. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, there's, there's so many topics we could unravel and it was a very open question, but um, sort of picking up on that idea um, of, Kind of needing or needing to travel somewhere else or the opportunities uh in in europe or the netherlands specifically i think sarah you'd, you've mentioned before that idea of kind of traveling off the island and, and what kind of difference between local uh local synergies and and kind of uh mm, reaching out for opportunities in europe would you like to kind of um maybe start by outlining a few of the characteristics that you see in mobility from your perspective Hello everyone. Thank you, Claire. Uh, so I'm Sara, red hair and in the 40s, <laughs> just made it. Um, and I'm, I'm an independent artist, artist uh, working in the dance field, like Claire said, but mostly working in the mainland, Portugal, but also uh, connected to, to Madeira Island. And But I'm bringing in the voices of um, some of the cultural institutions in Madeira, Enrique Amoedo from the Inclusive Dance Group, uh, Dançando com a Diferença, uh, Paula Erra and Elvio Camacho from the Theatre Company, Teatro Feiticeiro do Norte, and Elder Folgado, who is um, uh, an artist and curator and producer in the, um, in the fine arts. So it was important to me to bring their voices in because they do live, um, they are based in, in, in the island, and, well, and then we have a different perspective. So in terms of mobility, Madeira Island or the, the archipelago is very known as a touristic destination. And we do have a lot of flights uh, between mainland and Europe, um, but only flights. Uh, we don't have uh, boat routes or boat lines. The only boat line is between the two inhabited islands, Madeira and Porto Santo. And uh, we became very known as a touristic destination, especially because of our ecosystem, our nature, like Elena mentioned before, the, the beautiful landscape, but I would add the, the, the treasure because it's our, our treasure and which is the, the uh, Laura forest and all the, 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 the fauna and fl flora that we, we have. Um, in terms of cultural 
mobility, we have none a part of the, the pilot project, the Archipel EU um, Somadaira, um, as an autonomous region should have uh, local or regional funding, but that's a um, few uh, budget. There is little budget for that and also uh, not very clear criteria. So all the cultural uh, institutions are on all the artists are dependent on the national and the European programs and and between 2009 uh, with the economical crisis and 2018 if I'm not mistaken we couldn't apply for national programs so only on the four last years we, we made it and that made a, a huge difference already special for smaller inst uh, institutions and and artists. Um, so specifically for mobility, we have none, a part of the, the pilot project. Uh, but for instance, the, the regional government supports the sports field for mobility specifically, uh, but doesn't support the, the cultural and the, the arts. Um, and uh, usually uh, a local, person pays 86 euros to fly to mainland. Um, so you can foresee that each project has a huge investment in logistics and production for flights. And if you are, if you are traveling with your work with scenery or setups, for instance, it's extremely expensive. It's more cheap to, to travel inside mainland and to take with you the scenery then to to well you have when you are making your project and producing it you have probably to to think that you won't be able to take with you objects or scenery because it's um, it's overwhelming the the numbers mm. um, and yeah. yeah yeah no I think that's something that some um, We've, you've each kind of touched upon in a way that, that sort of connection that implies uh, investment of, of time, long flights potentially. Um, so how does the cha these challenges of mobility uh, impact the programming or the time or the cost? Or do you have kind of examples of, of how you sort of adapted around these challenges? Any, anyone who wants to kind of jump in? Um, I mean, in terms of programming, I must say that because of COVID, previously um, we had uh, uh, Uniarte had a building in the um, in the city center of one island, particular island Curacao. So before COVID would hit, um, it would be much easier to have um, in the residency um, to invite artists from abroad, and then it would be from the states or from the US. So it's. We are also a very touristic um, um, island, so there's uh, always visitors, and um, that is easier because they, yeah, it's a bit more um, logical to get grants from these um, countries for them to come do a residency by us. Then COVID came, and then um, so in terms of uh, good um, news, that kind of made us focus more and have to try to look, okay, how can we really try to make local residencies work? And um, something that was always there is to include all islands. But one reason that wasn't feasible is that if you mention 80 euros for a ticket by us to go to each island we're speaking about in high season, about um, 300 euros for a 15 minute flight um, that we um, have to pay. and. For the Netherlands, it um, in high season it can be about eight hundred euros. Um, so those are very very steep prices if you just also want to have a conversation between organizations. So during COVID, that um, meant that um, yeah we continued um, a program of residency, but by making it online, it has been possible to be open to all six islands. So um, while the world opened up, even for ourselves, we also made use of that. Um, another, um, yeah, what you would 
have is that each island comes with its different historical context. So um, that also is something that needs to be considered. Um, and um, yeah, for yeah. now, yeah. So I think you'd mentioned at one point that sort of the travel between say the Dutch Caribbean and Jamaica um, can sometimes be complicated or there's not so as many synergies, you know, from the for historical reasons. Yes, it would be even, I mean, in general education, you would say it would be much more um, natural to, let's say, study in Puerto Rico or Cuba even, um, or regional, but it's always catered to, or it's more catered because of financial resources um, to um, Europe. So there is a lot of um, students that when finish a particular grade that move, um, and therefore, um, the focus is more there. And while we, um, it's actually historically and contextually, also when you, term, you speak of art and culture, then you address the term of aesthetics. What kind of aesthetics are we talking about for each country? That's a different principle in itself. Um, so um, you would be want to have conversations with the English speaking, the French, or the Spanish, but even, I mean, historically, it's also determined that it's almost inaccessible really to get to the islands and you would have to go to London or it would be cheaper to go to London and then go to Jamaica as opposed to have, luckily we do have um, more and more flights, but it's still, if you think of hotel accommodation, all of those things are, are price, um, yeah, are, are just um, a lot. And if you look at, um, if there is a local funding body or sponsorship, it's um, usually they set requirements like, okay, you cannot spend it on gear, for instance, or you don't get to spend it on tickets because why? Um, so there are all these limitations that actually are very much necessary. Um, I've been able to do a lot of my work because I moved between islands and I've done that because I had family and friends and stayed over. Of course, not everybody should do it in that way, you know, but mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, and Suzanne, I think you, you had a, a comment. Yeah, there are a lot of similarities. Um, for in Greenland, also for us, it's very expensive to travel uh, domestic. And we have an obligation as a national theater to reach out to the whole country. Uh, but the logistics are, uh, you know, it, it's, there's one um, airline and it's expensive and it's uh, rural areas. If you go to the uh, very north, for example, there's one helicopter a week for one of the cities there. Uh, so it, it takes time. Uh, so we want to spend our our own money at the theater for those domestic tours. And then when we uh, collaborate internationally, we need uh, external funding and it takes time. So a lot of it is planning and it's, I mean, I plan two years, three years in advance, a lot of these uh, international collaborations. And we have to, because we have to get everything from external funding. Um, also, you can only, uh, the, the only gateway since Greenland is through Iceland or Denmark. So, you know, there's just the, the logistics again that, that pays, plays a big role in, in, uh, in how to get here and where we can get you know, uh, people coming in from and, and all of this. Um, uh, in Nuuk, which is the capital where we are located, we don't have an international airport as it is now, but they're working on that. So in two, three years time, we might have an international airport with uh, direct flights uh, from Nuuk. So that will change uh, the situation uh, and it will be very interesting what it will bring. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, like we, we've touched upon a bit the, the idea of tourism no? and how this kind of, um, I guess I was interested to, to hear a bit about how this might be in tension with uh, maybe more sustainable ways of traveling or the, the idea of time, you know, taking your time to sort of meet people um, and, and do sort of uh, more local tours. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what are, what are your thoughts about how to manage this tension between sort of the fast touristic travel and, and a more sustainable approach to, to mobility. So anyone who'd like to jump in? I can go. Um, well, definitely um, our archipelago needs that because uh, we, we do have a huge amount of tourists and there is more and more flights. We just have, we just have Ryanair flying there, 
So the low costs are reaching, but we don't really have a sustainable way of traveling like boat lines. We had a couple of years ago, a boat which would travel from Canary Islands would reach Funchal and then would go to south of Portugal. And there was even an idea of bridging that line between Morocco and maybe even going to the Azores Islands. And that would be extremely important, not, not just to connect all the area, but also to find sustainable ways or to, or to have different perspectives or find different strategies in the economic interests. And, and in terms of, uh, because of being so touristic, I think the, the ways of, developing also the field of arts and the cultural field it's to really develop um, a, a cultural tourism in in the area because so far the, the arts and the culture are were mostly developed as an entertainment or a mainstream for you know for the tourists to have a good time and that really needs to to change and to to have uh, festivals to have creations and programs happening there and, and bringing more people to, to, to the island to get to know the island in a different way with a different perspective and maybe a different aesthetic, taking the word of Shirley. Um, and, um, uh, and, and also looking at the, the ecosystem uh, that that means looking at what is living there because our forest and our ecosystem is so particular and everybody is there to go to see it but their relation with it it's uh, it's very uh, dry and 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 raw like our first inhabitants of the island are trees, the millennium trees called stink woods, and they are part of primary forests. And in our archipelago, we have the main primary forest area of European Union. So imagine, it's already a small island with the main primary forest. And primary forest means uh, an area was, which is untouched by human beings or which is not exploited. Um, our first inhabitant was a pingent who fly there and, and became an endemic species. We have the monk seals, which are uh, extremely endangered species. They estimated 600, uh, a colony of 600 in all over the world. And we have around 20 to 30. So we really need to protect and give them space. So one way that I see sustainability and developing cultural um, mobility is to think of land as being sacred, as being very valuable, as having will and, and spirit. So as, as particularly as the Europeans with a, a very European and you know, uh, Eurocentric perspective is to arrive to a place and, and feel that what is surrounding us and all the beings who live there, they are uh, sacred. So we have to develop different kinds of relations apart science, capital, or building hierarchy between different knowledges. And I think Suzanne in, in Greenland, there's also a lot of uh, natural park and protected and, and potentially fragile area. No? Oh, definitely. Yeah, again, a lot of similarities. We, uh, the most, uh, most of the population is, is located on the west coast and on the coast since we have the inland ice covering most of the island and the whole uh, northeast part is, is a national park. And it is, you know, fragile land. Um, I just, I, I, this is not in connection to anything. It was just a thought when Sarah was speaking that in Greenland, you cannot own land. You can only um, have a, a, a license to build on the land, for example. Uh, but, it, and the tourism here is, is small, but growing as is a lot of things. 
so it is, of course, going to be interesting how we preserve and, and, and keep uh, the nature in a, in a good state. And uh, I, I, I think the tourism industry is doing a good job, but it's, uh, it's important that there really is a, is a long-term plan for that. Um, we don't have a lot of uh, artistic uh, projects aimed only for tourists. So I think we can learn from something from, from Sarah there, um, but, uh, but it's something that is, that is in development, yeah. Mm. And Charlie, are there any kind of uh, sort of parallels from, from your context? Um, I think in terms of the sizes, it's relatively uh, much smaller. Um, what you do see now, like it, depending on each island, Bonaire um, has much more protected areas and has a higher priority. So, um, but by us, it's... Um, I mean, most um, most of the most beautiful areas are 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 gate catered to the tourism, and in terms of artistic development, um, it's always um, this point that you mentioned, Sarah. I mean, commercial or independent practice. I mean, most art um, and what gets to develop is uh, put into the orange economy in terms of the, this development, whereby it's catered to a particular audience. Um, but um, I think um, it can be a combination of it. Um, one of the examples I had, which um, I'm happy to share here is that when having um, artists on residency by us, they, um, we wanted to partner up with different um, organizations, but because they don't know maybe other ways of going about the art production or art product, project, it wasn't really on the agenda. But that work ended up being on um, in New York on the square. <laughs> the video work was displayed where, where they pay thousands and thousands of, of dollars for com marketing commercial. Um, and those are opportunities that are totally while well, you have a whole artwork displayed um, um, that was shot uh, on the island. So I think there are many interesting um, collaborations, but you need to have the opportunity to even locally address certain different forms of production. And um, to do that, you need staff um, for the staff itself to develop itself. And so um, even though we speak about tourism or even land protection or how to go about that, for me, it's really about, okay, so um, if you look at it from the helicopter view, I always say locally, we need to address certain things that are not Fluing, uh, fluently going and kind of mention that um, and then to say wh what our needs are. And, and it's still like not only the awareness that there is a possibility to go abroad and that will help your development, but also this awareness that um, locally we, we need, there is a lot to do. Um, um, one of the, the things, and maybe I'm going off topic, but it's the, um, another way also is the, the language that is used. So right now I'm in Amsterdam um, um, for work and it's always a different way of going about. I mean, I could get um, 30 emails in a day and that would be normal. Um, but I mean, there's no way <laughs> that through that communication on the island, that is a normal thing and 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 that that those type of communication is also also um, very tricky to have that as a standard also in bank transfers um caribbean banking systems i mean worldwide i think it's it has many challenges so um the bank costs are higher than um um than normally like transitional um, transactions. Um, some artists might not even have a bank account depending on their legal or illegal status on an island. Um, some, um, so the invoicing or the requirement of being a freelancer, um, that also <laughs> means different things in different ways. One can say um, one is a freelancer, but does, can one um, make a proper invoice billing that needs to be addressed? Um, and those are cases while um, their quality and their potential are so much that you want to help and you want to do something about it, but it needs kind of this larger infrastructure around for it to work. Um, 
And I think you, you've, yeah. mentioned, yeah, you've mentioned at a point that um, sometimes European funding can be can can feel a bit overwhelming because of the lack of in infrastructure no? in, in these contexts that sort of there might be opportunities available, but because of the size of the project that the funding is asking for, then locally that's that's a bit hard to achieve. No? Um, uh, so can I can I just uh, quickly because I I agree very much and I think there's very few people in Greenland who has actually applied for the European Culture Funds because it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of uh, um, following up uh, evaluation. Uh, so we often say if you want to apply for European fund, you need one person almost for a whole year to actually do the application, just take care of everything. Uh, there is, of course, European funding in Greenland, even though we're not directly a, a partner in the EU. Denmark is, we are not. So we can never be a direct partner in an application. We can only be an associated partner. Uh, and I've only ever tried uh, being an associated partner in one application. It was a lot of work. <laughs> so I understand why individual artists or smaller uh, institutions uh, think it's overwhelming and, and don't do it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And um, I was thinking about uh, COVID and I think it was sort of briefly mentioned at some point, the, the opportunities that uh, or the, the different connections that it, that it opened up. Um, uh, have there been uh, any opp opportunities because of COVID that have addressed a, a particular uh, local need or challenge? Well, in, in the Portuguese context, and, and specifically in the um, in Madeira archipelago context, there was uh, what was called the exceptional funding for projects. And because of the exception, in fact, they made it quite easier to apply. Uh, so the opposite of the experience to big funding projects like EU, um, and within that, there was some opportunities uh, which were very valuable. Uh, for, for instance, myself, I managed to, to devise a residency in, in Madeira Island with uh, five international artists, finding funding from one of um, those exceptional fundings from the national government. Um, but it was... Uh, sort of short amount and uh, in terms of mobility uh, none of us could find uh, funding uh, all of them were uh, based in European countries and none none of us made it possible to fit in the criteria of a specific mobility program for instance but for sure during the COVID there was some opportunity and some support for uh, and specifically for independent artists. Um, anyways, working in, in the performative arts, live arts, well, online, it, it's not really a possibility. Uh, it's not really a choice because it's not the way that we can make uh, our work or our art. Uh, we can always find strategies, we can always be creative, like what we do best in, in our lives, but it's, it's not everything. Mm. And I think, Suzanne, you've mentioned that before, no? the importance of, of uh, being present and taking the time to, to travel more slowly. And, and... Yes, very. I mean, theatre is a live um, art form and it, and it makes a difference <laughs> to be there in person. Uh, so I, in, at least in, in our theatre, we haven't adapted to, to uh, digitizing uh, our, our art a lot. Um, it's, it's not easy that the infrastructure for the internet is also a little bit, uh, it's, it's not on a, on a complete level where it's it's just accessible for everyone and and uh, you know it can be slow and all, all of these things so no we're we're big fans of the the live performances uh, mm -hmm. but i think we have learned some things and we've 
you know, try to adapt in a, in a small way, but now we're, we're really opening up and, and we are very busy because of all the, the projects that we've just been pushing ahead of us and that we can now actually do. We've also been lucky that, that uh, we haven't been totally closed down during COVID because we are so isolated that we weren't really affected for a long time. So we could work, um, but we could only have small audiences, for example. Mm, yeah. And thinking about sort of in-person meeting, um, Shirley, I think we've mentioned before that you can use the same language, but kind of not be able to translate things to different contexts or, or, or things, uh, there are different ways of working in, in different contexts. I was wondering if, you, if you'd like to have, uh, expand a bit on that. Yeah, I mean, um, historically, even, I mean, a region such as, such as Caribbean has always um, been, um, promoted in a particular way of leisure, pleasure, uh, sun, sea, and, and we all are in vacation mode uh, spirit. But it's unless you experience maybe how the work hours or how the heat affects your, your body. And you know, you can only go so many hours um, um, outside that you get that certain things might not um, be as normal. Um, then another, um, so that is important also um, in terms of maybe the um, overwhelmness of people maybe not engaging with you and not speaking with you only if they have met you for a few times and then understand, okay, I can trust you and, and open up. You know, that, that takes time in it of itself. Um, well, it's very much European to just start and, and, and talk about what I do and um, even I remember it took me years and I still have trouble with it that in one get go, you must be able to talk about what you do and who you are and, and that's that is expected of you almost. Um, but that's not the way um, culturally um, it has to be. Um, so when you know that there are these differences, then it's really, um, I think, important to have time and space to build on these things. And these are often matters that are um, neglected or maybe not seen as relevant as such. Um, uh, and that has also to do with maybe the practitioners, you know, how many practitioners do we actually have um, in certain positions to kind of, um, you know, cater to certain needs that um, are necessary. Um, I think um, due to COVID, I mean, one of the biggest realization is that you cannot really isolate and focus on one island. I mean, you can, and it's very well that it is, but if you kind of work with each other and because of the population sizes are also so small, um, from that is only a percentage that you have that is, um, that are, that choose to be a professional artist or, or cater in this. So you can kind of um, create programs that serves across islands, but that means that budget wise and programming wise that that would um, yeah require um, um, some um, focus on that, but it's definitely needed to, I think, have more time spent and, and exchange as well, because mm. um, I think there is countries this direct link with the Netherlands. I think it's good that they are opening up since recently. This is just like two, three years. And before that, um, they would even not know. Many people don't even know of um, the existence of the islands. Um, mm. And I think there are other links with other countries, with Denmark, with France. And that is very much interesting to explore those um, links because um, we are being taught at school, I mean, since young, that. We have been um, colonized by different, all these different countries. So there are histories on all different islands. There are all these different histories of everybody almost, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thinking about um, sort of the way forward, uh, what do you think needs to change or what perhaps is working well in terms of funding mobility from any of your contexts? Mm just um, because I was, um, I think the, these requirements, I mean, they're good and they're necessary, but I think in terms of um, 
in our context, then each island will be different. And that's really great that you put Susan and Sarah as well um, to speak. And it's so interesting that we have similar um, issues, right? And, um, but then I think it's really knowing that when these requirements are there, still have this flexibility and also building a relationship with the ones that are doing certain um, field work. So knowing who are the organizations that are working and to know how we can you know, bridge certain gaps. So it's not only for us or for me as um, with my one head artist and organization to have a relationship with my public, the audience that I'm building and the artists, but also me being able to have um, maybe a, a more closer connection with the, with, the, with the agencies or with these institutions so I could explain like, this is my situation and I wanna resolve it. But if there is this rigid only form option that immediately blocks me and that one thing I can do, I will choose to do that because the other one is just inaccessible for me. Um, so I think knowing the requirements, I know it's important, but there is always, historically we are formed, my education, um, on the street, in classrooms, at home, is formed to be flexible because you, your, your environment tells you that um, it's too hot, it's impossible to breathe. Like there are all these contextual and environmental things that are telling you to behave and to adapt to it. But the structure of the institutions are telling you to be rigid and be very precise and, 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 and everything. And um, yeah. And it takes it takes it takes a, a Caribbean um, not a, a Caribbean but a creative mindset to, and but also a vision to kind of crack and find loopholes. But I guess in certain conversations like this, I'm always like, okay, no, flexibility is very one of the solutions. I think. Mm. Yeah, the flexibility to be to create those relationships and to take the time to to develop. Mm. Can I, um, uh, yeah, I very much agree with uh, Shirley. I think uh, um, inspired by, because we're so close to the Nordic funds that are very, uh, like they they have a longer history and they're very established. Uh, what it, what the, one of the models that really works is the network, funding for networks. And so, for example, one of my personal ideas is now to try to establish an Inuit artist network so that it goes across and see if we can get funding for that, because um, we, we need to connect <laughs> more. And uh, so maybe, you know, smaller networks that goes from, you know, across this, the, the rural areas or something could be some kind of model uh, in the way ahead. And, uh, and also, um, the, to create some kind of funding for uh, for for establishing uh, collaborations, so funding for just meetings, for pre meetings, for connecting, uh, so that in the beginning, that we can actually um, have a little bit of money to just the travels, maybe just to cover the travels, and you know, if I could go to Shirley and say, okay, so what could we do? What do we have in common? Is there uh, history of colonization that we can, you know, mirror or what is it to just start uh, like a like an upstart, and and then from there we could build the project so that we don't have to, you know, build the big project uh, before we can actually meet. Um, that would be great. And and again, that's one thing. And the other thing is uh, funding for individual artists to to travel. It, it's something I think would be very important also. Sarah, are there any kind of uh, thoughts that you have of, of you know, what could change or, or perhaps what's working well in terms of funding for mobility? Well, I underline their words, both of them, and also in relation to our area. But, well, I would just say it has to, to work both ways from the ones who are living in the islands. And please don't forget when we live there, that's our center, it's not periphery. So periphery, it, uh, well, cent we are always in our center and periphery is surrounding it. So it's extremely important to change that perspective, to really challenge where is the periphery. 
or not. Um, and and yes, the, the the people in the islands, the projects, the artistic objects have to travel, have to go, but also we have to receive and it has to, to play and work both ways. So mobility has to be funded in, in, in both ways. Mm. Yeah, I guess that touches upon um, what we we're, we we're talking a bit about before and, and kind of thinking about the local funding and, and how that's positioned, you know, is it, uh, we were talking before in the context of tourism and the way that certain projects get highlighted, perhaps to cater to sort of the more creative uh, uh, for artistic products for tourists, no? And to think, you know, do I have to travel to Europe um, in order to further my studies or to, to open up opportunities? Um, and is there a way to kind of maybe stay in place as well um, and kind of have a, a stronger, um, uh, as you say, Sarah, more uh, having travel going two ways, but also to, to sort of think of um, the other side of, of, of being in place as well. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, I'm not sure, Johan, if we have uh, any questions, if we want to open it up to the floor. Uh, we, we thank you, Claire, and thank you uh, for, for our speakers. Um, we don't have much comments and questions uh, in the chat at the moment, okay. um, but maybe uh, we can ask uh, participants to raise their digital hand and, uh, and ask their questions directly. I see that uh, Françoise um, is uh, there asking for the floor. Françoise, the floor is yours. Please. Uh, briefly describe yourself for our visually impaired participants. Francois, you're muted. Sorry, so I've got uh, some kind of issue. I'm not Francois, I'm Georges Emmanuel, but okay. you know, I've been sharing the, my computer and I forgot to change your name. So, um, uh, let me introduce myself. So I'm male from Martinique, uh, and I'm a sculptor and digital artist. And um, we was like um, in touch with the same problematics like the COVID, the mobility, and everything. And uh, I moved my art creation into virtual reality for that purpose. And so the ability to share my artwork with um, the Oculus headset and to different people all around the world. And so I think that talking about solution, this is a major one, I think, because you can expose your art and share it and introduce the world to what you are producing. The cost that is like quite low right now. Basically, with your cell phone, you can make a digital version of your heart and share it all over the world using those pretty classes and augmented reality. Mm -hmm. And so, um, what? But the thing that you can't do is like, uh, if you need the talent and you need the gear and special gear to make a digital double, for example, or if you need the skills, this is where the mobility comes to a problem to us in the Caribbean, for example, because all those talent are and tools are in Europe. And you need sometimes, not as the artist it's himself, but the talent that you are using for a playwright or some piece of art that involves using an external part of the artist, I would say, um, to be digitized or to move or to be filmed with special gear and tools. So sometimes the tools need to come to the island or the tenants need to move somewhere else to be able to make this piece of art happen. Yeah, I think, Shirley, um thinking about that between sharing skills and sort of uh, developing emerging uh, artists, is, is that something that, that UNART really looks at, uh, sort of uh, developing connections within the region? Yeah, um, and I must say I'm, I'm the next generation, um, uh, one of the next generations because you have 
other artists who, who started to do that on the island, like Elvis Lopez, Atelier 89, and then you had the Caribbean Link, you have also the IBB, kind of this idea that um, there are art, international artists coming and teaching and passing on skill and mostly catered to the art production and, and preparing kind of, um, yeah, artists or, or um, um, uh, kind of build, helping uh, people to build their portfolio. Um, so what I, I try to do um, in Uni Art is to see, okay, how can we improve a particular art and culture climate um, by attacking and doing experimental projects that need kind of a nudge and see how I can influence that because it's so small scale. So whatever you do, you get an, an somebody's attention and it's like you, and that's what we're missing because often every day, um, every year things can get very monotonous. So we all get stuck in this, Space of like, oh, here's the same thing, the same people. And so kind of how can I break that? Um, and so um, the first, one of the first ideas is, okay, with no money, just see if I can get space and leave people be able to use that space in any way possible and see what emerges, do tryouts and tests. Um, that kind of involved, I mean, in, in through the course of the years, but now really working with curators from the region, but that is because it's digital. I do not, um, I would not um, want to only have digital, <laughs> please not, but it's, um, for now it's perfect um, because that, that made me see, okay, how can we work with, for instance, a curator in DR, Dominican Republic. So Gina is right now the curator of the online residency. And then I'm trying to see, okay, for this program, maybe I don't have somebody right now available on island because everyone is busy with their own projects, but understands the vision and kind of work with somebody on another island. So I'm also trying to see if in Jamaica something can be done, but very, you know, like online. So in that way, kind of bridging. Uh, and it's really um, by going through these institutions that were already busy or having participated to a program Caribbean, uh, um, like Caribbean LinkedIn, which I also saw the link of New Institute Tilting Access, which is like another, you know, has similar found, the founders. So you really get to see if you're dedicated, if, you're, if you put in the work, I mean, you will get to the places, but it's a much longer trajectory um, that you would have to be willing to take. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, so in terms of, of development, a cross can really help. And there is a great divide between generations as well. In terms of opportunity, that's also an obstacle. I mean, in a small place, you kind of know everyone. So that brings it its own kind of politics. I think everyone can, from a small place, can kind of relate to that. And um, so having people new and fresh um, points of view and perspective is always kind of welcome mm. as well in that um yeah yeah and I guess that's that's one thing that I guess we're just kind of talking about now is the in a way kind of mapping and, and sort of discovering new voices that you might not have known by the via the internet or via the online and then from there seeing what happens you know seeing how you can sort of develop that and, and kind of make those connections and perhaps um sort of yeah ups, upscaling or kind of bringing in different um freshness as you say different ideas and 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 that's kind of a good starting point in the online yes. space and i mean one thing is that you really see that even i mean in europe the options are not as extended because with the open call i specifically um open it up for um artists that live and work in the region are based and and and, and work in the region so as opposed to the diaspora and that's not to, to, but it's important to have that separation because what happens also is that um, otherwise everyone in everybody that moved because they studied, they had to move at some point um, and they don't get enough, enough opportunities or it, um, even um, they get to apply and they're happy to see an application, but then you immediately get this the distortion of, of uh, levels of, of um, opportunities as well. So I have to, take into account because there are certain, um, you know, bases that needs to be covered in terms of writing, um, applying for even a project proposal. How do you write, go about writing that? Um, but also in educating um, the facilitators, which is an open call that just came. 
you know, to have enough people that know about finance, coordination and everything, because not all artists are um, as equipped to do all the organizations that needs to happen as well. So kind of really look um, to, to promote writing, you know, there's um, things have to, has to be written or videos need to be produced to communicate to a larger audience. All that is, is helps to kind of take the work out or make the, the niche larger. Mm. Yeah, um, we have a, a, another um, um, hand, a digital hand that just rose uh, from Marta Fernandez. Uh, Marta, do you want to take the floor and, and briefly describe yourself? Hi, hello, everybody. I'm Marta Fernandez. I work for OCTA with LM as the program's advisor. So I just wanted to uh, take the floor to maybe offer a clarification. I think it's um, it's important to know that OCTs, so uh, all the Caribbean islands, Greenland, and also all the French uh, territories, they're all eligible to EU programs. So that includes Creative Europe fully as partners. They can obtain all the funding. They can be coordinators. However, it is true that um, in, uh, I'm going to link in the chat the report that Okta does. And there have never been any creative for your press where an OCT is even a partner. So this is a, a fact, not even a associated partner that we know. And apparently it's the same case for autonomous regions, which is one of the reasons DG Radio uh, launched this initiative, Archipel. Uh, well, initially the, the pilot program, which then became Archipel. So um, it is true that uh, Opportunities are not adapted to, to smaller populations. Um, uh, however, there, there seems to be a trend where uh, they're offering more opportunities to more uh, kind of like specialized opportunities to kind of bring other types of organizations and territories into the program because what you're describing also applies to rural regions of Europe, which are isolated as well due to lack of infrastructure of different kinds. So voila, just a little clarification. I'm going to link uh, maybe some yeah, time to promote Okta as well. <laughs> we uh, OCTs do have the obligation to report annually, on, not, not annually, uh, twice per MFF on their participation on EU programs. So Okta does that for them. And I think it's very interesting to look at the figures because for example, all the OCTs are doing an excellent job on Erasmus, and there, there are a lot of creative projects on Erasmus, and I think there's a way, as Erasmus has much smaller budgets, which with 70-80% co-financing, there, there is a lot of activity, from, from especially from the Dutch Caribbean, but also from Greenland is doing extremely well with the schools and also the French territory. So I think, I think there is a lot of talent already and a lot of... Um, uh, knowledge on the land. It's just that the Creative Europe program in particular has a co-financing rate of like one or two million euros, uh, 50%. So it's, it's, it's extremely inaccessible for smaller organizations, which are the majority in those cities. Voilà, so uh, another point to, to the conversation. Yeah, and thank, thank you for giving me the no, thanks. Thanks for the comment. And uh, thinking about the the bigger projects, is it sometimes a challenge to to kind of get um, partnerships organised uh, between uh, cultural organisations in different countries? Kind of, I'm sort of directing this to our speakers. Is is that also part of the challenge? Is to kind of make this big project with with multiple uh, partnerships? I think for us, I don't know, uh, we are in a, in a lucky situation that people do want to work with Greenland and, and sometimes uh, in the best way possible and sometimes, pardon my language, but because we're a bit exotic, you know, so there are different approaches to it. Um, but uh, so I, I think we're in, in that lucky position that we really have to choose the projects and how much we can do and who we want to work with. And, and we do have a, a, 
sort of a friendship theater in Italy, for example, that we're st starting to work more and more with. Uh, so so the, the opportunities are there, uh, but it takes work and it takes, you know, determination to go fully into a project and, and choose how much we can and what we what we can do where as I said you know we're we're the national theater but we're so small so so the administration is also there's just a lot that we that we need to have under our uh, roof sort of we're also an acting school so it, it's a lot under one one roof um I'm sorry I lost uh, track but um I'm yes, yeah. Sorry. yeah the idea of um Perhaps in, in your case, it's it's not the challenge of finding different partnerships across different nations, but sort of more of a, a capacity challenge. No? Yes. Finding yeah. the time to, particularly if you've got multiple projects on the go or if it's sort of funded through the Nordic countries and perhaps a few smaller fundings taking up a lot of time, the idea of a bigger project is sort of... Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. Also, just another small point. I do find that, for example, those the Nordic countries I keep going back to it, and the Nordic funds are opening up a little bit more for funding in the Arctic region. And that's something that's very interesting, uh, that they see the potential and the need in the to come to connect the arctic region to the nordic region so that's uh, i think it's it's uh, again one of those things that's in development and we're looking forward to to that uh, growing more so sarah kind of thinking about the the context uh so from from your context um uh and maybe do you, do you see that there's maybe not enough funding for individual artists for mobility? Um. Well, sometimes as if you are working independently, even having a network, your your own connections, it might be pretty hard to to reach um, bigger programs, bigger applications, um, because well, you have an independent scale. Uh, what I find that always works is when you have direct direct connections and, and relations by that meaning really knowing presenters and curators and producers who will help you to to bridge and to make connections between institutions and hopefully between programs because well uh, AU pro program, wouldn't be applicable for my reality. Um, all right. I'm not sure if there are there's any other questions or comments from, from the public or from our chat. No, I think we, we don't have more questions and comments, but I think also we are about to, to finish this conversation. And I'm, I'm really sorry in a way because it's short and frustrating, which is good. I love, I love frustration because it creates the desire to, you know, start this conversation again and continue it in one way or another. I'm going to thank you, Claire, for facilitating this conversation. And I'm going to thank, of course, our three panelists for sharing their lived experience and, and work practice uh, uh, in relation to cross-border mobility, but also many other issues that were in a way echoing the realities of their peers in these different contexts. Um, maybe I just can say that I, I'm, I'm happy that we, we collectively shed light on these different realities in relation to artistic collaboration, many impediments or challenges that are met by us professionals. Um, I can take many takeaways from this conversation already. The relationship with tourism, uh, digital inclusion, domestic flights or transportation being difficult, all this administrative and legal environment being very tricky to navigate, as far as I understand, but also the need for flexibility in terms of fundings and, and trying to design projects and not trying to find the cracks in the system to, to get support, which is a very, very interesting also point made by, by Cherily. Um, I, I like also to take the idea with me of 
how do we challenge the very notion of periphery? And, and thank you, for Sarah, for, for putting that on the table. Um, if, I, if I may take three points with me and, and hopefully uh, continue this conversation uh, uh, later, uh, not only with our On The Move colleagues, but with uh, uh, the On The Move members and with our partners from Archipel, is there is a lack of sense of belonging to the European Union, let's say, or at least some confusion. I think uh, Marta raised the point of the eligibility of organization based in these territories. And I think it brings me to, I mean, it, it, it allows us to say that we need really to, to think about this further. Um, and if I just share some, some, you know, information, background information, when preparing this conversation, I've, I've asked uh, my colleagues from uh, Perform Europe, as you may know, the Turing uh, Support Scheme for Performing Arts, and also colleagues from ePortunus Houses, the Mobility Support Schemes, two pilot actions at European level, both uh, implemented under the Creative Europe programs. And they were sharing the, you know, very, you know, with sad information that for ePortunus, they received no application from uh, the ORs or the OCTs over the 448 applications. They had really few uh, uh, applicants that even chose as a destination to go in these territories. And only two grantees were, you know, granted to travel to the Canary Island and to Azores, you know. And for Perform Europe, the same story. Um, uh, they, they didn't, I mean, they couldn't even, you know, monitor or collect the information, both at research phase, but also during the application process on how many applicants were applying from these territories. And among the 85 selected organization to benefit from, you know, touring money, uh, none of them were from these regions. Um, the second you know, take away from me uh, from today is also that uh, the cultural mobility in, in the European outermost regions and overseas territories and, and countries is under research and under documented somehow. And I know our colleagues from Archipel are, are putting a lot of efforts in also, you know, mapping and, and, and documenting the reality of mobility flows. I think on the move will make a concrete contribution to this effort by analyzing the mobility call, the open calls, and, and the data that is circulated on its website in order to give some sort of snapshot of the trends and the flows, a little bit like we did uh, with the cultural mobility yearbook that we just published some days ago on, on the move website. Um, and in order to aggregate this information, I think we, we need to continue to map the practices and the needs uh, from the practitioners. And it feels like we also need to collect way more suggestions and ideas and recommendations. I mean, for us uh, from the field, you know, but also recommendations for other member states and the EU. And I'm sure uh, uh, we will you know, take on board the, the many suggestions that were formulated today. But also I would like to invite the participants to share their ideas and recommendations. Uh, we will be circulating a, a quick, very quick evaluation form, you know, six questions, five minutes. So uh, uh, in order to, of, of course, collect feedback on this uh, mobility webinar, but also for you to post your recommendation and suggestions on this topic. And as part of these uh, suggestions, uh, On The Movie is very keen to hear from you on any other hot topics or burning questions you, you would like us to address in future mobility webinars. So um, it's my, my pleasure to thank everybody who attended today's uh, webinar, to thank again the speakers and moderator, Claire, uh, our partners, uh, archipel.eu, but also whole round who live stream this conversation. I want to salute the work of my colleagues, uh, Marie and Tanya, and to say again that this webinar was supported by the EU and in particular, the Creative Europe program. So don't hesitate to be in touch with us. 
to follow us on social media, to subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, it comes in many languages. And to join us on the 25th of May for our annual cultural mobility forum that we organize in Helsinki, but also online. And again, live streamed uh, thanks to whole round. So thank you everybody and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.